the Joe Rogan experience. Yeah. So let's let's get going. Um, so taking it from the top, let's let's discuss. Give us your take on how we got here because this is uh, it's been very strange. Obviously, uh, the president completely miscalculated what was going to happen and the way he was explaining it to the news. He was kind of saying that it was just a few cases and they'll be gone. And now, obviously, New York City shut down. The entire country is separated from each other. Everybody is isolating at home. Give us your take on how we got here. Well, you know, the the truth is uh, we knew this was coming or something like it. We had a heads up and and, and even even a heads up before last year because this is now our third major coronavirus disaster of the 21st century. We had uh, what's called SARS, Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome, in 2003. That started in China and caused a terrible epidemic in Toronto. It actually took the uh, the Rolling Stones to do a concert to bring the economy back to Toronto in 2003. And then it was MERS, coronavirus infection, in uh, 2012, and this is the third one. So we actually realized that coronaviruses were going to become a new thing, and we embarked on a big coronavirus vaccine program a decade ago. And um, and each time they've caused devastating hospital epidemics. They've affected healthcare workers. So uh, the point is, this unfortunately has become a new normal for the globe. Is terrible coronavirus uh, epidemics. And uh, we saw this one coming up in at the end of 2019 in China. And uh, I knew we were in for trouble because that's what coronaviruses do. So you knew that we were going to be in trouble because there was no way they could contain it and keep it in China? Well, the, the difference with this one uh, compared to the other two was this. The other two, SARS and MERS, now we call this new one SARS-2. So there was SARS-1, then MERS, then SARS-2. So both SARS-1 and MERS made you so sick and had such a high case fatality rate that anybody who got it was almost immediately hospitalized and basically out of the community. The, the difference with this one ironically, is it, it's, it's pretty lethal. It's about five to ten times more lethal than regular flu, seasonal flu. Uh, but also there's a big group of people who don't get very sick at all. And so you have this sort of perfect mix where it's not the most lethal infection we've ever seen. It's not the most transmissible infection we've ever seen, but it's high enough in both categories that it combines in this very toxic way. So what you have is you have a group of people who are getting very sick or in the intensive care unit, like older people, those with diabetes and hypertension, even a group of younger people who are getting it very sick, and then a larger group who are only getting mildly sick who could still walk around the community and be out and about in stores and restaurants and infecting everybody. And so this is what's caused the problem. Uh, it's a it's highly transmissible, and there's a lo- big group of people walking around spreading it, and a smaller subset, but a big subset, who are getting very sick and even dying in intensive care units. So that's what's playing out in New York City right now, for instance. Do we know why so many people are asymptomatic? We don't. Uh, we really don't. Uh, there's a, a rough uh, correlation with age. So younger people seem to do better and actually kids seem to do really well with this infection. They don't, they don't get, with, with one exception that I'll tell you about in a minute, most kids don't get very sick at all, but they're helping with the community spread. And, and we don't uh, quite know why. Also, but something that's very important and one of the reasons why uh, I really wanted to come on and talk to you about COVID is we, there's this buzz out there in the community that it's only old people that are getting sick and dying and going to ICUs. But in fact, the Centers for Disease Control came out with this very chilling document a few weeks ago showing that about a third of the very sick people in the hospital are under the age of 40 or 44. So between 20 and 44, young adults are getting very sick. And that word has not gotten out adequately because when the fr- in fact, this infection first appeared in central China, it was all about older individuals over the age of 70, those with diabetes and hypertension. And we didn't hear about the young adults. But then for reasons that we don't understand, we saw this big group in Italy, in France, 
on uh, Spain of younger adults, and we're seeing that play out in the U.S. And I know, you know, and the people who, you know, listen to you and watch you, you know, it's a big group between that age of 20 and 44, and they really need to hear that they are at risk for severe illness, despite what they might have heard previously. Well, we have a friend, uh, Michael Yo, who was actually on a podcast with me the week before he went to New York. He was there that weekend, actually, and that's when he got it. So he got COVID-19 in Manhattan and then flew back, got sick. And here's what's really, maybe you could help me with this. Uh, he said he was feeling terrible and then took Advil and it got exponentially worse. Is that coincidental, do you think? I mean, there's, there's been talks of avoiding ibuprofen. Michael's 45 years old, very healthy, very robust guy. So when he was... I mean, he was in the hospital for a week, and his words were, I almost died. I mean, he was really, yeah. really yeah. concerned. What, yeah. what about what about ibuprofen? So uh, there's been a lot of buzz on the Internet about ibuprofen, and then the World Health Organization came out with a specific statement saying those are rumors. So there's not a lot of evidence to say that you get worse with ibuprofen. Probably he was just one of those young adults that's going to get very sick and that's what this virus does it has the ability to get deep into the pulmonary system in your lungs binds to receptors on the cells of your lungs and causes a terrible pneumonia and on top of it you get a big inflammatory response so it really uh, can uh, it's a severe pneumonia can even prevent your ability to breathe and that's why so many people who are getting really sick with this virus have to go on respirators that's exactly what happened to michael he got pneumonia um, so there's is that there's a rumor that you shouldn't take ibuprofen, but is that unfounded? Are you advising people to take ibuprofen? Do you think they should just avoid it just in case? And where did this rumor start from? And what, what is the concern with I, ibuprofen? And then, and then you've got the problem, you know, some people, uh, you know, also say don't take aspirin because if this is a respiratory virus infection, there could be a severe reaction uh, with, with aspirin as well. So for now, uh, you know, and uh, I said the other thing, Joe, is anything we say today uh, I might look like the biggest idiot in the world tomorrow or next week, and that's because this is a brand new virus and we've never seen before, right? So we're on a steep learning curve. So we're learning new things about this virus uh, every day. So that's why, uh, you know, so many things I'm going to say today, if I sound like I'm waffling or hedging, it's, it's because I am. Uh, um, we're, we, we're learning so much that's new about this virus. So it's really important uh, that everybody be really mindful and pay attention to real health information that, uh, that from accurate sources because things move, things change as we learn more about this. This is a virus that we didn't even know existed uh, about four months ago, and um, we've learned about it in an incredible period of time. The Chinese put up a lot of information on these preprint servers about what the virus is, what the sequence is, the genetic code, what the receptor it binds to. When we had the original SARS, we call this new one SARS-2, the COVID-19. So the, the disease is called COVID-19. The virus is called SARS-2, SARS coronavirus-2. When we had the original SARS-1, it took us over a year to learn all that information. Now everything's been compressed in a few weeks, so it's really extraordinary. But there's still so much, so much we're learning right now. That I'm so glad you brought that up because that is really important for people to understand. People that maybe haven't looked into the complications that are involved in trying to recognize treatments and cures for a virus. That it is, it's you. you everyone's learning. Yeah, and also. You know, and everything we have known so far about the virus is what happened in China. And it turns out the Chinese are, have some genetic differences to Europeans and, and Americans. And, and things can change depending on it's not just the pathogen. It's also what we call the host, the person, too. So the fact, you know, that the virus affected young adults in Europe and the U.S. in a way that did not necessarily occur in China uh, is important. And so we are keep we and then who knows what happens when this virus goes into Latin America or India or sub-Saharan Africa. It may and it's not because the virus is mutating necessarily. It's just that there's also the host component as well, which is quite important. Well, that's one of the uh, issues that people are having in terms of blood type. There's there's all this talk of certain blood types may be more susceptible to the virus, particularly uh -huh. blood type A. 
Yeah. Well, actually, um, this is actually well known in the infectious disease literature. There, I mean, there's a whole. I put one up on Twitter, I think, a week or so ago. Uh, there's you know dozens of different pathogens, both vi including viruses and bacteria, that behave differently depending on a, on a person's blood type. So, host genetics influences things qu uh, quite a bit. 